Okay, let's uh, di discuss now what are the uh, recurring process steps, possible process steps that require a mask. Uh, there are uh, four families, essentially. The first is doping. Of course, we need to have several differently doped regions in the, in, in the wafer. And there are two possible ways to obtain the doping of a region. One is diffusion, and the other one is ion implantation. Diffusion consists in putting the wafer in a, in a camera with a, a gas containing the dopant at a high temperature, between 900 and 1100 degrees Celsius. And in this way, the dopant in the gas penetrates into the silicon layer by diffusion. Just because the concentration in the gas is much higher than in silicon, we have this diffusion. as some ink in the water, essentially, in the same way. Therefore, what you obtain is a, a profile of the doping that is uh, uh, deeper and deeper the, the, the more time you wait, and that of course is maximum on the external surface, and then it goes uh, down when you go deeper into the silicon layer. So, if this is the silicon surface, you have a doping profile that is typically something like this it's a, the sort of Gaussian shape. Okay. With ion implantation, you have a different thing. You, uh, uh, no, let, let me just make one step back. In order to mask the diffusion in the regions in which you do not want to diffuse anything, you need, for example, a simple layer of silicon that acts as a mask or of silicon nitride uh, that uh, can act as a mask. So again, you need the previous photolithographic step. With ion implantation, the di we have a slightly different uh, ion implantation is a process that is much more controllable than diffusion. You basically um, accelerate uh, ions of the doping species that you want and you essentially uh, push them into the silicon. So you have a, a, a sort of ion gun with which you accelerate the ions and you, uh, let's say, um, really um, shoot them in the silicon wafer. And of course, you can adjust the depth, the average depth of the ions as a function of the energy with which you accelerate the ions. Okay. So in that case, you can obtain a profile that is typically steeper and also not necessarily higher. You do not have the maximum at the surface. You can have the maximum at a depth that you decide as a function of the energy with which you accelerate the ions. So it is much more flexible as a, as a, as a doping process. Of course, there is a drawback, is that with, by shooting the ions in the, in the silicon layers, you create some damage because it often displays some silicon atom from the crystal. And uh, in order to repair the damage, you need to make a so-called annealing step. In the annealing step, you put the wafer in an oven at about 1,000 Celsius degree for few minutes, between 15 and 30 minutes, and then you let it cool down slowly. And why this works? Because basically when you heat the, the wafer, you um, put the atoms in vibration and in motion, and by vibrating they, let's say, recover the correct position in the crystal, and you have a repair of the, of the old wafer stru crystalline structure. So, when you do an implantation, you always need a subsequent annealing step. 
for uh, let's say advanced and, and very modern silicon processes, CMOS processes, you always have ion implantation. It's more expensive, but of course it's much more performing. Okay. The other important process is deposition. Deposition means a deposition of a complete layer over the whole wafer surface. A layer of some material and depending on the material that you want to deposit you can you you need to use a different uh, type of deposition uh, here we list the most important ones the first one is uh, oxidation that is a particular type of deposition you basically grow silicon oxide on top of silicon you expose the silicon surface to an atmosphere rich of oxygen and then you have oxidation at the surface. If you do it in a controlled way in terms of temperature and pressure of the gas you can grow a very very high quality silicon oxide on top of the silicon layer. It's a slow process you can do it for small thicknesses but it, it is very uh, very very high quality oxide that you obtain <coughs> with a good stoichiometric uh, uh, ratio two atoms of oxygen for each silicon atom then another deposition process is the so-called chemical vapor deposition which is called also CVD the acronym that is for example used for the deposition of silicon nitride silicon nitride is uh, uh, has a formula which is Se3 and 4 is a, a, is an insulator and it's very hard so it's very good to use as a mask for example if you want to do ion implantation you need a stopping layer for the regions in which you do not want to implant the ions and for example a layer of silicon nitride is perfect for that it can really stop the the ions in, in the silicon nitride instead of letting them go into the silicon layer beneath. And in order to do a chemical vapor deposition, basically you put again the whole wafer in a, in a, in a chamber with a, a gas containing the, 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 the species that you want to deposit and you have to heat everything at about 850 degrees Celsius in the case of CVD. And therefore, slowly, the uh, silicon and nitrogen atoms uh, can go on to, can deposit on the surface and form the layer that you want. These processes are typically done wafer by wafer or sometimes also in full batches of 25 to 50 wafers. They're very uh, they have a very high degree of parallelism. So, another similar process is chemical deposition that is, for example, used in particular for polysilicon. Polysilicon means polycrystalline silicon. It's a type of silicon that is not a unique crystal, but is formed by, me by several uh, small crystals with different uh, orientations put together and it's typically used for the gate layer of the MOSFETs. In that case you uh, it's quite similar to CVD uh, in, in principle then there are uh, differences at a more chemical level but basically you put the wafer in a chamber in which you have this uh, uh, lane gas which has a formula uh, that is SiH4 so it contains silicon the wafer is heated at 600 degrees and therefore in time what happens is that the silane over the surface of the wafer has a reaction and you have the formation of polysilicon you have the, the, the position of a layer of silicon that is not uh, crystalline because the temperature is too low to have a crystalline 
layer but is uh, polycrystalline. There for aluminum you have another type of deposition. You see for more or less for each type of layer you need to have a special deposition process. The process that you use for aluminum and actually also for some other types of metal is called sputtering. You typically have a vacuum chamber in which you have the wafer, you have a piece of aluminum and then you heat the aluminum by means of electron bombardment or ion bombardment and then basically pieces of uh, um, uh, atoms from the aluminum are uh, evaporate in this way and uh, arrive on the surface of the wafer. So you force the evaporation by heating the sample with uh, electron or ion bombardment. Okay, these different processes have uh, are, are different in terms of uh, also uh, let's say difficulty and sophistication of the process, and are also very different in terms of uh, let's say uh, accuracy of the thickness of the layer that you can obtain. For example, with oxidation you can obtain a very thin layer, a very precise layer of silicon oxide and that is needed because the gate oxide has to be very precise, for example. With sputtering, I mean, you cannot be much precise. Basically, you, you have a, a thickness which is... Which you have a layer that is rough, the thickness is pretty variable along the, the wafer. But it really depends on what you actually need for each step. Okay, then the other two most important processes are the etching and the planarization. The etching is what we have seen before. You need to define the patterns on the surface of the different layers, 3D patterns, so patterns with a depth. And there are two types of etching, the wet etching and the dry etching. Uh, the wet etching is the simplest type of etching. You, you essentially use an acid or basic solution in order to dissolve the, 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 the material that you, have to de that you have deposited and that you want to remove. So for example, if you want to remove silicon oxide, you use a solution of hydrofluoric acid. And for each type of material that you want to remove, you have the proper solution that can wash, can dissolve the material. Wet etching is almost isotropic. So this was the example before. We had, uh, you remember, a structure like this. We had silicon oxide here. Then you have the mask. And then you use wet etching, for example. And you can let's say, do something like this, because the etching attacks in an almost isotropic way. So if you want to remove silicon oxide, you do not have sharp edges. You, let, let's say, you, you, you um, go in all directions with, with, the, with the etching. <coughs> The other possibility, which is much more expensive, but more useful for very compact processes, is to use dry etching, which is also called plasma etching. I don't want to go into the detail. Now the thing is different because you drive the plasma with a variable electric field. But the important thing to remember is that this process is much more complicated, but you can obtain really sharp edges. You can go vertically and remove uh, completely, if you have this mask, the silicon oxide below here, and conserve this one. <coughs> so the wet chain, if you really need to, if you really want to have a very compact structure, you, you need sharp edges and you use plasma etching. And, uh, Of course, for large-scale fabrication, these costs are not really important. Okay. And then 
the other important process is the planarization. Because in practice, you need to have several layers on top of the other. And when you do processes like this, for example, the etching, you obtain a, st a structure that is not really planar. So it's difficult to grow many layers, one on top of the other, because at some point you have something that is uh, uh, not planar at all. And this planarization process allows to flatten the surface and allow the deposition of the subsequent layers. Uh, the, the planarization process happen, is called the chemical mechanical polishing, the, 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 the standard process. And basically, there is a liquid, which is uh, um, there is a liquid carrier with an abrasive component inside that is used to, let's say, to to flatten the surface of the wafer. And you have to repeat it uh, several times because every few layers you need to planarize everything again. Okay, this set of, of processes are enough for for combining them together and uh, obtain a complete, uh, uh, a complete integrated circuit. Okay, L let's look now at the simplify simplified process flow. So w what's the sequence of things that we need to do to fabricate a complete circuit? Uh, now we look, we look at it at a very high level of, of abstraction just to understand the big structure and then we, we, we go a little bit into the details. So first we start by defining the active areas. The active areas are the areas of the wafer in which transistor are. transistors are. Okay? The active areas. Then we separate the active areas with the trenches, with the silicon oxide trenches that have to be etched and then filled with silicon. This is the first part in the whole wafer. So, definition of the active areas and insulation between the active areas with the so called field oxide that acts, as, as I said, as an insulator between neighboring devices. Then, once you do that, you can implant the well regions. You have to create the well regions, uh, essentially one for each group of adjacent transistors. If you have a single well process, you have also the, 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 the only the N wells. If you have a dual well process, you have to define the well the N-well regions and the P-well regions. So when you have done that, essentially you have defined the positions of all the transistors. And then you can uh, create the gate stack, which means deposit the silicon oxide, deposit the polysilicon, and define the gate. When you have the gate, then you can define the source and drain regions and the related contacts. And then, when you have defined all the contacts, you have all the transistors on the wafer, you can define the metal interconnections and connect all the devices. And this is the fifth step. <coughs> Can I go? Okay. Now let's go step by step. I am repeating exactly the same things, and uh, but but uh, I'm going slowly, just to let's say explode each phase together. So we start with the P substrate. We grow an epitaxial layer because we need the high purity 
silicon layer. You, you have seen it in, in, the, in the movie yesterday. This is a complete wafer, okay, for the complete wafer. Then, second step, we grow the, um, we, go, we grow the um, oxide layer and on top of it a silicon nitride layer. The silicon nitride layer is called the sacrificial layer because it will be used, as you will see, to stop the dopants and then it will have to be removed. It is used as a mask, essentially. Okay. Then we go on, we define the different active area by defining the trenches. In order to define those trenches, you need, we need to do plasma etching because we need to go vertically. So we will have this active region here and another active region here. They are insulated because the P layer is almost insulating. And we have to put uh, silicon oxide in the middle in order to have a good insulation between the two regions. Okay, this is the phase one. We go on and we fill the trenches with SiO2, silicon oxide deposition. We put silicon oxide and it, it goes in, in the trenches. Then, of course, the structure is not going to be planar because it was already not planar. We need the planarization step to make everything flat again. After that, we need to remove the nitride layer or in, at the same time, basically, because CMP can also remove the nitride layer. So. We remove the nitride, there's no more nitride here, only the silicon trenches and the oxide that we have deposited before. Then we go and we define the wells. So first the N implant. Here we're going to have PMOS transistors, so we need an N well. Um, so we need to dope the um, the end well, and also you, you see here uh, the, there's a VTP adjust implants. Basically, what we do here is that we have a, a region at the top which has a higher doping, and this serves to adjust the value of the threshold voltage of the PMOS. And this is done because, we, uh, as we have discussed before, we need to have the same VT the same threshold voltage for the PMOS and for the NMOS and does not come by chance. In order to have it, we need to adjust the doping of, of the regions of silicon close to the silicon oxide to adjust finally the doping in order to obtain the same uh, threshold voltage for the PMOS and for the NMOS. Of course, when you do that, you cover this part with uh, a, a layer of silicon nitride, it acts as a mask, and then you will have to remove it. So you first define this with a mask, the, the regions in which you want to have the end wells, then you do the iron implantation, the annealing, and then you will have to remove everything and do another photolithographic step. Okay? So this is what we do here. We use another mask, we, ref we define the regions for the P-well, this is again the silicon nitride sacrificial layer. We do the P implant and uh, see, yes, yes, the P implant and the adjust implant here on the surface in order to have the threshold voltage that we want. So at now we are at the second step. We have defined the two wells, and now we need to define the um, uh, gate stack. So in order to define the gate stack, uh, this is a little bit simpler than it is in reality. You see, basically, they use another mask in order to deposit, poly no, first they deposit polysilicon everywhere, then with the mask they etch the gates. This is the gate length. 
so the, the edge, one part of the. Uh, yeah. Now, this is a little bit different from what I said before because you, you can see here, probably you have noticed that in this uh, sequence of figures, um, the gate oxide is defined first and then it is preserved up to here. While when I discussed before the sequence, I said that at some point we make the gate stack, the silicon oxide and the polysilicon. Yeah, typically you could do in both ways, but actually what happens that is that if you do the gate oxide at the beginning, all the process that I've described up to here uh, creates some damage in the gate oxide, and then this is not so. It is not so good at this point. So actually, the, the, the modern processes re, uh, uh, remove everything and redo the gate oxide in this position so that you have a very good quality of oxide. OK? So it, it is not inconsistent. Actually, in, in the history of the technology, I've seen both things. But it's difficult that after all those steps, the quality of the gate oxide is still good at this point. So uh, this is a nice. Um, thing because you see, uh, uh, l let me say it again. You you grow the polysilicon everywhere, and then you etch and preserve only the part that you need for the gate. Uh, this is a process that is called self-aligned. Because you see, it's not actually important if uh, it's exactly centered in the middle of the well or not. You define the complete gate length. So in the end, the length of the, of the gate is fixed. Uh, you're not defining the source region and the, and the drain regions, and you obtain the, the gate length as a difference between the two. Because in that case, if you have some inaccuracy, then uh, the, the, the inaccuracy sum up for, for, for the gate length. In this case, you, uh, in case you have some errors, you will have a longer source and shorter drain or vice versa, but the length of the, of, the, of the gate will be exactly L. This seems an easy part, an, an obvious part, but actually was a, an important uh, invention of the 70s. And actually, it was another invention by Federico Fagin. The, the, the patent for this self line process was again by Federico Fagin. OK, when you have the gate stack, you can define the implants for the, for the source and drain contacts. First, uh, one of them, so for example, the P plus contacts for the P MOSFET and then with another mask the P the N plus contacts for the N MOSFETs. You remember this is the N MOS and this is the P MOS. So you you see at this point you have completely defined the two trans transistors and you more or less only need to connect them. So you start to deposit SiO2 here with holes because on these holes, you will put the metals, and on top of the silicon oxide layers, you will put all the interconnections. So uh, the, the black squares in the, in the layout figure that I've shown you before correspond to these holes into which you put metal to connect the interconnect layer to the source and drain contacts. This is the first layer of aluminum, the first interconnections. <coughs> and then you have the second layer. And then in modern processes, you have up to 10 layers of interconnects. Because you have so many transistors, you need a different height to have interconnections. And typically, the lower metal interconnections are the thinner one. And when you go up, you have larger interconnections and, and, and longer ones. So 
the lower levels are for the local interconnections and the more you go high the more you you you, you have global interconnections so typically for example the clock is very high because it has to be distributed over the whole chip and the, the connections between adjacent transistors are in, at the lower levels okay so uh, at least at this point we have connected all the possible processes the sequence and and the circuit okay this is a, uh, this is just a photograph to show you how complicated it can be uh, this is a, a, a chip in which for 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 making a, a nice photograph all the insulating layers have been removed so this silicon oxide which separates the the aluminum layers has been removed so that you can see the interconnections and you can see I mean, you have metal one the, here uh, below you have the transistors then you have metal one you, you should you should be able to see the picture here metal here are the transistors then metal one then these are called vials that connect one, one metal layer to the other then metal two then on top metal three then on top metal four and you can imagine you can go up to ten Yeah, this is another picture of the same thing. Uh, I'm not going to, into the detail. Actually, something changed in about uh, about 10 years ago in 2000. No, maybe a little bit more, because uh, before 2003, the interconnections were done with aluminum, and then after 2003, all the interconnections have been done with copper, because copper has a higher uh, conductivity and therefore it's good for uh, obtaining higher frequency of operations. Copper is much more difficult to, 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 to process as a material than aluminum so it was uh, an important let's say step in the in the improvement of the technology and the process is, is called dual damascene the process to use copper interconnects it, it was uh, invented by IBM in 2003 and it was and now it's used everywhere but I'm not discussing to the details now okay this is what I wanted to tell about the fabrication process uh, <coughs> now uh, we need to uh, discuss the second part uh, how the circuit designer and the process designer are going to interact and to decide what can be done and what cannot be done um, because they have different uh, uh, incentives and different uh, um, uh, requirements um, now I suggest to make a break here so that we can continue the discourse after